Hello and welcome to this special CNBC Africa discussion on power sector reforms in Nigeria. I'm Wale Famriwa. Last November, previously government-owned power generation and distribution companies in Nigeria were sold to private sector investors. The move is a significant step towards the provision of reliable power in Africa's largest economy. Another requirement for the smooth transition of Nigeria to a private sector-led power sector is the declaration of the transitional electricity market by the power minister. The declaration will give effect to contracts signed by investors and a wide range of reforms designed to create a private sector-led power industry. The declaration of the TEM is behind schedule because a wide range of challenges remain. However, recent media reports indicate that the declaration of the TEM is now imminent and joining me to discuss the impact of the TEM on Nigeria's power sector is Ayo Ekpo. He is the Commissioner of Market Competition and Rates at the Nigeria Electricity Regulatory Commission. Wale Shonibari, the Managing Director Investment Banking at UBA Capital. In America, Ewe Lukwa, the General Counsel and Company Secretary at the Nigerian Bulk Electricity Trading Company. And of course, Adeo Yefade will be the CEO of Transcore Ugeli Power, a power generation company in Nigeria. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation. I thank want to start you. with you, um, Dio, and just get your thoughts about the team, TEM. And everyone has been talking about it for a while. Right now, it seems to be behind schedule. Your thoughts about how ready we are. I mean, several challenges remain. We know the issues around gas. We know the issues around um, transmission of electricity in Nigeria. Your thoughts about how we can move this forward. Okay, thank you, Wally, for having me. Um, I think if you, if you think about it from two, from two angles, one is progress. And then the second is how much progress. I think if we look at it from a progress standpoint, we are making a lot of progress. I think uh, TEM spells out the beginning of stability. TEM means, you know, like you said earlier, contracts become effective. Uh, for us as generators, as you know, you want your PPAs to be effective. You want to be able to get maximum revenue so you have the ability to be able to expand, do more work, and be able to generate more at the end of the day. Uh, however, uh, there's been challenges. Yeah. As you know, the interim market started uh, a year ago, starting in two days' time, I think, on November 1st. So you know that uh, we plan to do it March 1st, and it never happened. So you, the first question that you asked was, uh, or your first observation you made was that it's been delayed. Yes, it's been delayed uh, since March 1st, and now we're talking about November 1st, potentially. Uh, and that could also, uh, in the coming days, be you know moved by maybe anywhere from one to 30 days, in my opinion. Yeah. But I think the key to look at is that the CPs have mostly been uh, have mostly been uh, been completed. Uh, there's been a systemic uh, approach uh, with NERC, with everybody else, to sit down and look at all the things that are required to actually move into TEM. Yeah. And we've just taken all those as a checklist uh, approach, and we'll be able to at least, uh, I don't want to use a percentage of 90 or 85, but I would say we've completed the majority right. of actions that are needed to be able to move to TEM. Right. So, in in America, is that your sentiment as well? Yes, I'll uh, echo uh, Dewey that the, um, a lot of progress has been made in this sector, uh, particularly over the last 18 months. And um, as much as uh, TEM has not yet been declared, it's uh, important that the preconditions to TEM are actually um, put in place. Because um, as has been pointed out, TEM actually means the commencement of um, binding legal obligations which of course is a massive shift from the uh, pre-existing PHCN era. And um, when you're about to get contracts that, that, that are now legally binding, you also have to think of disputes and things that follow that. So in order to prevent um, a catastrophic um, uh, scenario where you have multiple disputes playing out across the sector, it's important that every uh, case taken in putting in place different the measures that um, are required to ensure that we have a well-functioning market when term is eventually declared. Mm. All right, uh, I want to get to your thoughts on this. Um, you, of course, represent the regulator here. And how ready are we? Uh, do you think we have we've dotted the I's, we crossed the T? Are we? Are we is it imminent? Is it really truly imminent? Yes, it is. Um, I think the the thing here is that Adewi has used the right words, I believe. Um, systemic approach. Yeah. So we are less bound by deadlines and more bound by the effectiveness and our preparedness or our attainment of clearly identified markers or milestones that take us to a day when we say term is effective. Um, Namdi has also pointed out the fact that this is an era in which contracts will be effective. 
So you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you are already in default mm. um, just because you didn't prepare well enough. So we have taken, um, and as, when I say we, I mean in the policy making and in the regulatory spheres, the Ministry of Power, the Electricity Regulatory Commission, the, the, which advises the minister that, look, all the, that we need to have done prior to term being declared have been done, and mm. you may then, at your earliest convenience, declare term. So we're working together on this, and um, there has been a, a bunch of people from across the industry with the regulator and with the ministry over the last two years or so that have been systematically working through the conditions precedent to the attainment of term. Mm. We've pretty much done all that. Now, sometime earlier in the year, March, April, we realized that um, there are also what we call non-market rules conditions precedent. All the conditions precedent that we're trying to attain are set out in a document called the market rules. But the market rules also recognize that there might be one or two instances in which we need to get things done. And um, those will also equally be important. One of those things which we've recognized is having to make good the shortfalls that arose during what they also referred to the interim um, rules period mm. between when new owners came in and term was declared. Uh, I won't go into details of why we needed an interim rule period, but we did need one, and we also understood that there would be shortfalls that would arise, shortfalls in payments due to um, Ade's company and other right. companies like his generating right. companies and other uh, entities that play a role in providing energy mm -hmm. to the distribution companies right. to sell to their customers. And uh, we, we agreed that we needed to make sure that all those shortfalls were made good, the tariff was reset, before we declare term. So from a purely technical perspective, everything that needs to be done has been done. In fact, um, we have actually been shadow trading, so to speak, since the beginning of September. Mm. Shadow trading here basically means do everything that your contract requires you to do, except give effect to sanctions and things like that, just to see you know, how well prepared we are. And I would say that from what it is we've seen, we're just going through a process of analyzing the first set of data coming through. We've done pretty, pretty OK so far. Right. The final bit, if I may just take a little bit more time, is this yeah. thing about the, the, the shortfalls and the payments due. Mm. And that's where, which I'm sure you will come to, the CBN intervention and all that comes in. Mm. And bedding that down is really what is now keeping us um, back, but we're we are close to that also. Right. And I'm sure that sooner rather than later, Tim will right. definitely it, No be. question, we'll certainly talk about some of those interventions. But Wally, I want to hear your thoughts. I mean, you interface with everyone, I imagine, the regulators, the operators. And of course, several issues have been raised here, which many people suggest are the reasons why one of um, them hasn't come to effect up to now. So, your thoughts about those issues? For instance, the issue around gas supply, um, the the, and we'll talk a lot more about this. The capacity of the transmission company. Your thoughts about those issues? Can we really mm. bring them into play at this stage, mm -hmm. with those issues still not totally sorted? Okay, uh, thank you, Wally. Just looking at it from perspective of the you know financing community, many of the, a, a lot of the financing here requires the contracts to actually take effect. Yeah. For so the f the longer you have the contracts not taking effect, the more of an issue it is for all the investors, you know, equity and debt. We know that there are some weak links along with the chain. You know, there's a gas issue there, and there's also the uh, transmission issue. Mm. Having said that, though, I think it's critical that in order to get the sector to move forward, that contracts do take effect. That's why we welcome the work that the regulator is doing with the CBN to try and make sure that some of the core impediments, such as the receivables, uh, are being settled both for the gas and also to the generation companies uh, who are operating under interim rules. Mm. The, the investment issues are very long term and they, it's going to take a while to, to turn back the clock on the underinvestment that we've seen in the gas and also in the transmission uh, sector. So these are longer term issues but there's short term um, requirement to declare the market open because it also affects the pipeline of projects that are on the way, such right. as the NIPP projects, right. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Absolutely. We'll talk a lot more about some of those projects. But let's, again, look at the environment here and do your thoughts on this point. So if we implement them and some of these contracts now become um, effective, and for instance, a, a provider like Transco needs to provide a certain amount of electric, um, power to um, the bulk trader and, and so forth, but then, of course, we know that we're having challenges with gas. Do you get the sense that 
given the things that we've seen, especially with the intervention fund that has now been put in play, that we can get everyone doing their bit. Uh, because many people speak to weaknesses along the chain. So even though many people suggest that the, the, the generation companies are perhaps in the best place in all of this, but the distribution companies will have challenges. So your take on this? Well, look, I think we welcome time. I think, I think, the, I think the metrics drive the behavior, right? I mean, I think uh, we want contracts in place. Well, number one thing when you have contracts in place is performance. You can measure performance, and even more important, you can penalize for, for non-performance. I think that's very key to understand. I think uh, Ugeli has probably been, uh, not to plug Transco, but as you know, we've been number one in the country in terms of growth, uh, probably since uh, takeover. I'll let the commissioner confirm that or not. <laughs> but I think we've gone from a place of 160 megawatts, and now you're talking 500, 500 megawatts thereabouts. I think to triple it in a year is a lot, but I think the key thing to note is that TEM allows everybody else to do the same thing. It's not magic. I think we've had, you know, to, to, to be able to use your investment uh, to have the right levels of not immediate revenue, but at least you can plan ahead. That's one thing TEM does for you. I can plan ahead. I can understand what I'm doing. So you to give a scenario of gas, yeah. that is a non-performance issue. You know, I have take or pay requirements. I have, you know, there are many things that protect you. So it's not a case where I drop from 500 megawatts to zero with no recourse. Mm -hmm. If I drop from 500 megawatts to zero, it's a system shakedown and somebody's going to have to be accountable for, for those things happening. And to be honest, it's not a gas, let's not just keep shooting at gas. Gas also gets a chance to be able to understand their revenues, have LCs in place, make sure things are in place so they can also put the right investment into whether rehabilitating or expanding their infrastructure to give you enough gas. Mm. So it's, uh, it's going to be a system, is what I'm saying, when this happens. All right. And we'll st talk a lot more about Transcore success. I think it is really um, remarkable, and especially given the challenges that we've seen in this whole process. But let's talk a bit about getting everyone healthy. And I guess that is why we have this intervention fund coming into place. Um, I mentioned earlier that the distribution companies in particular, and I know the um, bulk trader will interface very closely with the distribution companies when TEM comes into play. How do you assess how ready they are for TEM right now? Um, for NBET, um, which is um, NBTCs are the, are the center in a sense of the market yeah. um, between the, um, the, the Jenkos and the Discos, um, we've been uh, looking at the two sides and it's important that um, the, as they say, the chain is as strong as the uh, weakest link. and. Um, it's important that all the players in the sector are actually geared up towards um, more efficient performance as we get into term. And for the uh, for NBT, of course, the our receivable receivables are from the discos, mm -hmm. and uh, we pay the uh, the jenkos. To the extent that um, one disco is not doing what it should be doing, it um, creates problems upstream. Not just for so it's important that not just one disco, but all the discos need to be functioning um, as they should. And that's part of why, as part of the, um, the vesting contract that NBT um, has uh, signed, that will be coming into force when a term is, um, before term is declared, uh, NBT has uh, put in place a requirement that there should be a payment security uh, f so that there's uh, something to fall back on in the event that a disco, for some reason or the other, is unable to meet up with its um, payment obligation at the end of the month. Because the, that story is not something I can tell uh, Dewey, you know, that there's a disco that can't pay. Mm -hmm. So the, we are confident that all the players are doing what they are doing now, that the NERC as a regulator is also looking into how to ensure that um, the different uh, entities within the sector are all um, incentivized properly to live up to the obligations. Mm. All right. Well, do you want to share some thoughts about that point? Like I mentioned, trying to get everyone healthy, making sure that when TEM kicks off, it will kick off successfully. Mm -hmm. Are there, is there anywhere around the, the value chain that you, you, you have some concerns? Yeah, um, absolutely, Wally. The system economics has to work. Mm -hmm. And for any investors in the sector, that's what you're looking at, right from you know, uh, gas up to um, the actual distribution. Mm -hmm. you know, the collection. Uh, technical losses and the commercial losses need to be brought down. Mm. And it's very important that the discos are financially buoyant in order to do that. There's a bit of a catch-22 situation right now because they don't have, the discos don't have the funds. As a result, they can't invest in the electricity meters that will bring down the losses. Mm. So unless the economics are correct, 
which means even the mito needs to be looked at to make sure that it's predicated on the right level of losses, mm -hmm. you know, which is more realistic, closer to 50% as opposed to the 17 odd percent that was in the original calculation. Mm -hmm. So once that's right, it feeds all the way back through the value chain and, you know, you talked earlier on about potential solutions for the transmission company. Yeah. I think once the contracts are in place, then you can start to look at possible securitization of you know, those transmission fees right. to allow investment to go into the transmission company as right. well. We certainly will talk a lot more about transmission companies, but mm -hmm. I think Wally has raised something which I th would be interesting to get your thoughts on. Mm -hmm. The discos, um, they have challenges. And he, he actually referred to maybe tweaking the, the tariff structure. Perhaps that's something we should look at. How open is the, is the NERC to this? I don't think it's a question of how open we are. NERC is statutorily um, required to set tariffs that reflect the cost of doing business the prudent cost of doing business and give every operator a reasonable, enable every operator to charge a reasonable return. So it's not something that is arguable. And so the, it's, it's, um, the question doesn't arise of distribution companies or any other company in the electricity sector itself um, under, being underfunded. However, distribution companies incur costs, which some of them um, have to be identified and determined. One of them, which Wally pointed out very eloquently, um, is that of losses. And that's the last bit of, of um, in the set of costs that we have to look at. And we've spent the last 10, 11 months looking at the actual technical and commercial losses suffered by the distribution companies, which are then to be costed and put back into the tariff. And we've right. done that work. That work has been completed. Okay. So one can say that for the first time, we actually know now what it does cost reasonably to deliver one unit of electricity to a customer. Right. Now, that is going to be put into a tariff, and we're about to do that. Yeah. But um, would, that, would that change come before or after TEM? It will, it will come before TEM. Right. We're at the closest stages of, of, the, of, of the tariff setting process. Okay. And this is then where, the, um, this is where the, the utility, and I would even call it the beauty of the <clears throat> intervention by the CBN comes in. Ordinarily, it would require that our tariffs go up fairly high. But mm. because the CBN with the sector is working through this intervention process, the net effect of taking a chunk of that tariff and paying it in advance into the industry is to reduce the, 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 the total increase in the tariff mm. to what you might call uh, acceptable um, levels. Um, mm. To put it simply, that's really one of the biggest single benefits, apart from the fact that that also closes the gap that had previously existed in the um, flow of funds into the industry. Right. So the CBN intervention has two very critical strategic uh, um, purposes, right. tempering the extent of the increase in the tariff, but also closing the gap itself in the revenue um, stream that comes into the industry. Right and enabling everybody to be, to, to be funded. All right, I need to take a break now, but we'll continue this conversation around power sector reforms in Nigeria. Of course, we have been speaking to a very distinguished panel that understand the issues around the transitional electricity market. When we come back, we'll continue this conversation on power, power sector reforms in Nigeria. Stay with us. Welcome back to our conversation about power reforms in Nigeria. Still with us for this is Ayo Epo. He's the Commissioner of Market Competition and Rates at the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. Wale Shunibari, Managing Director of Investment Banking at UBA Capital. Nemeka Ewe Lokwa, a General Counsel and Company Secretary at the Nigerian Bulk Electricity Trading Company. And Adio Yefadi Ebi, CEO of Transco. Ugeli Power. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for staying with us. I want to come back to you, um, Dio Yan. Maybe just talk a bit about Transcore success and just trying to understand how you've been able to manage to do as well as you have given the interim rules and the challenges around that. Can you just speak to that point? Uh, because what we hear is that given all the challenges with, with gas, it's been, a, it's been tough for many um, power, gen power generation companies to succeed in the current environment. No, I think it's been tough for Transcore too. I think there's no doubt. I think uh, without taking all the credits as is, I think you must also say that you know, we're a bit closer to gas. Right. Uh, as you know, with the Ugeli, Ugeli East and, uh, and the Shello Torogu plants. 
um, you know, MPDC and NGC are quite, as you know. But I think, with that said, I think we're going to give ourselves a bit of credit in terms of focus. I think we've had the focus from day one. Uh, uh, I think a clear vision uh, in terms of this is how we're going to start it and we're going to stay. We're going to have the staying power. Uh, as you know, uh, we have some of our lenders here and one of our managers in terms of UBA, so they can testify or at least they can confirm the fact that we've, we've, we've decided, you know, rather than focus on revenue making, let's just focus on, on, on hitting our targets, hitting our milestones. Right. So we've put a lot of investment into uh, rehabilitation into in, uh, and not moving away from the plan. So that means if you think about an environment that we are in, be, having the ability uh, to have your board be able to, to provide you as an MD the right level of funding to move forward and be able to do all those things we said we we're going to do is a big deal. Right. Um, so, so overall for us it's just about, it's been about focus, about teamwork and having really the right level of expertise at, at the assets be able to make those things happen. So, right, so funding obviously has played a part there. So let's talk a bit about that. You know, this intervention fund that has been brought in by the central bank, um, and I think it could be a game changer. But Wally, let's hear from you. I mean, you're a banker, so you probably understand finance more than anyone else here. Your thoughts about the best way to approach intervening in this power sector and how this, this CBM funds should be applied. Yeah, uh, thanks again, Wally. Um, the intervention fund is very welcome. It's, it's, it's being cooked right now, so it hasn't been launched yet. True, true, but we, true. we fully expect that it will be launched. Mm. And the key thing is to demonstrate with this fund to the world that this, the economics actually works in the sector. The reason you've had the interim rules is that there hasn't been sufficient money coming into the sector. So basically what government is doing is rationing out the money available amongst uh, you know, the different players. So mm. that's why the Jenkos are being paid 45% of their capacity charge. So there's a 55% receivable. And mm. as Ade was saying, it's very difficult for companies to operate and carry out their full investment plans if you're not getting all the money you should be getting right. you know, in line with your projections. Mm. It's very difficult to continue to invest. Mm. So the uh, fund sends out a very, very clear signal to investors, both locally and internationally, that the sector itself can sustain itself. You know, mm. once the fund is in and everybody sees how it's all working out, you clear all the legacy debts, even the IOCs that you expect to supply you with gas, there are receivables for gas they supplied before. So you need to clear all of that <laughs> right. before you can then say to them, look, there are domestic gas supply obligations that you need to follow. And invest more in gas infrastructure, processing, right. etc. You're extending a very clear signal. And lastly, we have a whole raft of deals that are just waiting. It's like subs waiting to come on to right. the pitch right. <laughs> for yeah, waiting for this intervention fund mm. to be put in place so mm. that we can then move the sector to the next level. You know, right. I mean, we're just at the beginning. We're right. nowhere near where we ought to be. Absolutely. So clearly very important for this sector. Do you want to share some thoughts on this as well? Your thoughts about this intervention fund and what it could do for the sector? Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm in the kitchen doing the cooking. <laughs> so uh, as to use the, the metaphor that, uh, that, that Wally has used, that Wally has used, sorry. Um, but I, 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 at this point, it's no longer about what could we possibly do with it. The fund comes in at a time with a very clear, at this time with a very clear objective, and that is to close the funding gap that has been existing in this market for quite a while, mm. and then take us to that point where we have tariffs properly set. All those p um, entities that are they, that Wally had been referring to who had been owed um, for being in the market, from being in the market will then get paid, and we just start on a clean slate. Mm. I, I, it, it needs some kind of perspective. You know, we've been on the road to reform in the, in the power sector over the last 13 years, but it really took off almost to a new level. In fact, to a new level um, in 2010. Um, and we then went into the privatizations. Um, at the time, you know, it's, it's always easy to comment from the outside, but privatization is, in many respects, very political, um, with a bit of economics thrown in. And one of the things, uh, to look at timelines, uh, milestones, what do you want to do by a certain date? The 2015 elections um, mark a, a, a major point. And in 2012, 2013, if you looked at the transactions themselves, it was clear that they wouldn't be completed by the time the election 
elections came in if we had to do everything one after the other. One of those things that needed to be done was identifying the losses that the companies make and that number of what they make goes into the tariff setting. But it's a long process. Mm. So a decision was taken by, 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 by policymakers. Let's go ahead with the privatization as long as the buyers, the field of buyers understand where we are, all right, and agree that this last bit, the losses, would be determined by them with the regulator as we go along. Yeah. That meant that there would still continue to be that shortfall in the market until the losses were identified, determined, and put into the tariff. Mm. And that's why the interim rules came in. So now that we know what those losses are, close that gap, all right? Close the gap, and then go forward from there. The great, and to my mind, probably the best for the Nigerian consumer is that that fund coming in into, in, in, into the market at this time is like, I projected to earn so much over the next 10 years. I then get paid a part of that 10-year income today, all right? And that means that I don't have to increase my tariff to that level that I would have collected over the next 10 years. So this is going to pay off for so the consumers, it's, it's, definitely. It's, it's going to pay off for the consumers big right. time. Now, <clears throat> paying me in advance, 10 years in advance, places major obligations on me. And that's the other side of the coin, all right? That these funds will be put into the market but at the same time, there will be a lot that will be expected from the distribution sector, from the transmission sector, from the generation sector. Right. And so putting all this together is really what has taken all this time. And um, I think one can safely say that we're putting it to bed. And right. the, the meal that is being cooked will come out and hopefully it will be palatable to everybody. We certainly hope so. We certainly, certainly hope so. Okay, let's talk a bit about another big challenge in all of this um, reforms in Nigeria's power sector, and that is the um, transition, uh, transmission mechanism, the Transmission right. Company of Nigeria. Many people say it's still a weak link. And then I want to just get your thoughts about perhaps some new thinking about how to approach this because some people have spoken to suggest that maybe we should consider privatizing the transition com Transmission Company as well. Your thoughts about how we can deal with this because that capacity will continue to be a challenge if, we're, if for us to meet some of the big cha um, targets we have, 10,000, 20,000 megawatts, we need a very strong um, functioning transmission mechanism. The transmission corridor is definitely very critical to the success of the sector, um, particularly for NBET. The, of course, the issue of um, whether to privatize or not is a policy decision for the government. Sure. But the, for NBET, um, apart from the, uh, the existing GENCOs that we have um, power purchase agreements with, we're also signing uh, agreements for new power. And a critical issue that always comes up is the question of transmission. Mm. At the moment, if you look at uh, some of our contracts, we NBT makes capacity payments when a generation company cannot put power on the grid because of failure of transmission. Probably the, 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 because it's not the generator's fault. The generator is able to put power on the grid, but there's transmission failure. But then if Unless um, there's a very serious effort to make the transmission uh, system very robust, it's actually a major exposure for, for NBET. So what was the best way to approach this? Because it certainly hasn't been fixed yet. So how do we get it fixed? I believe that, um, uh, first of all, uh, government has uh, taken steps to um, put in place a management contract for the uh, TCN. Uh, the, the other thing is I know that there are also proposals for um, funding transmission um, projects, uh, injecting substantial funds into the transmission network to make it more robust. Um, for the power purchase agreements we're negotiating, some of the uh, developers are also proposing, in order, uh, as part of the process of putting their power on the grid, uh, also doing some transmission uh, work as well. Um, a few of our, uh, the proposals we're dealing with are also proposing that. Of course, subject to the regulator uh, agreeing that such costs should be incurred. Mm. So the ultimately, there's a policy decision to be made about whether the privatization of the uh, TCN is the is the uh, best approach to to it. And um, I believe that uh, at the highest levels of government is something that is also uh, giving sleepless nights on how to make sure that it works. Right. I think so at this stage, I guess we can only offer ideas. So Wale, your thoughts on this point? Uh, how do we fix transmission? Well, as the key thing about transmission is it requires significant investment. And you also have manpower requirements. You know, staff have to be trained yeah. um, to undertake these um, 
you know, repairs and expansion. But um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, we've seen approaches adopted in other countries. Uh, the national grid of Great Britain is actually listed on the stock exchange mm. over there. So um, there are different things that you can do to inject more capital into the system. The key thing is, as we all know, it's not just about raising money alone. You have to make sure that those monies are used in the most effective manner. So right. the management com uh, contract is a good start. But if you're going to privatize something, you have to be able to privatize something tangible, something useful, because it affects valuation. Sure. So typically, before you privatize, in a lot, lot of cases, you try and restructure so that by the time you bring it to the market, it's actually worth something. Mm. And government is not giving too much away too quickly. But aside from privatization, like I said earlier, there are securitization type options. As long as the revenue stream is quite clearly defined, you know, you can raise bonds against this revenue stream, yeah. you know, which uh, should also assist. I know f that uh, government uh, also use some of the proceeds of the euro bonds, which will be put into the transmission. Right. But the transmission company needs to be given the freedom to come to the market on a regular basis. Right. So we need to start preparing it for that. Correct. Right. And okay. you need to tidy up the accounts and some other, you know, mm -hmm. um, house tidying to make it. Do you, you want to share some thoughts on this point? Transmission. Still sounds like a weak link. We know we, gas is, is there, so we're going to find a way to fix that, especially once we get the tariffs rise. And I think we're on, on, on track to, to getting that sorted. Yeah. But transmission, I think, it's certainly like um, Wally has suggested, it requires heavy investments. What's the best way to approach this? Yeah, I think, I think Wally put it rightly. I think, I think to make a strong statement like it's a weak link or it's, uh, or it's uh, from this perspective would, would not, probably not be the right approach. I think yes, uh, we, we you have two privatized sectors on, sitting on either side. You have generation, you have distribution, and you have other players who are moving, you know, full speed, full speed ahead, you know, doing everything they can. And then you have this seemingly government core who's yes. going to wield this power. And yeah. it, it seems like every time something is not moving as fast, there might be a problem. But I think the key is very simple. Uh, they kind of know what they have to do in terms of to grow. Uh, and you're putting the right, in, it's heavy investment and it takes mm -hmm. a lot of focus, like we said. It's not just investing, it's not just getting the funding, but making sure you have the right people there, you have the right expertise. I know mm -hmm. Naptin is doing some different things. I know, you know, there's a lot of things happening. So I think the next conversation should be, in my opinion, yeah. uh, at the highest levels of TCN to have a sit down and mm -hmm. really talk about what their rollout strategy is in terms of getting from where they are now to mm -hmm. where they need to be to serve the system. Right. Hey, very short views on TCM. How do we approach TCM? Well, happily I'm a regulator. I don't have to <laughs> make policy decisions. And Namdi has pointed out the fact that it, it is critical. There, there's, the time is now to, for mm. there to be a clear-cut policy direction given as to the future of TCM. Right. But we have a management contract in place, and that's going on for another two or three years. So we're, we're, we're buying time. TCM is pretty much a, still a, a long-term challenge. But to come back, that two or three three things that one could mention very quickly. First, TCN, like the distribution companies, has never really had a cost-reflective tariff. We're working through with TCN to, to determine that transmission charge that is cost-reflective, mm. and which, as Wally has pointed out, can then be leveraged, because you've got this very steady stream of revenues. Everybody must go through a transmission company. So you've got this very steady stream of revenues coming through over the next 15, 20, 25 years that can then be leveraged. Mm -hmm. and funds can be brought in to, for, for long-term investments. That's mm -hmm. one. Second thing is that in the short term, NERC has put in place what we call the embedded generation framework that, that enables distribution companies to bypass key constraints in the grid in their areas of responsibility yeah. <clears throat> and then buy smaller packages of power that can then be connected directly to their distribution networks. Right. But that's a short-term solution. It's not right. the, the long-term solution for the last... <laughs> 150, 178 has been to have a grid. Yeah. And you, can, you still can't bypass having a grid. So while we deal with the short-term challenges, there's still the, the long-term question that will have to be answered by the, by the NCP right. and, the, and, the, and, the, and the TCN. Right. I, I, I really like the uh, mention of embedded generation. So it's, it's the and it's innovative thinking that we need to succumb some of the challenges. Yeah. Wally, you want to share some more thoughts about, especially w when you look at the distribution, distribution company. Right now, they seem to have perhaps some of the biggest challenges. So your thoughts about the new innovative thinking that they can use to approach some of the challenges that they will be facing in a, t in a term 
term policy environment. Yeah, one of the quickest wins that the distribution companies need to go for is um, reduction in the collection losses, mm -hmm. and that's going to come from smart metering. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the precedent out of places like India, where they've managed to reduce uh, losses from about 50% to 3%. You know, I'm actually talking to some groups who have managed to achieve that. And the way they did it was through very smart metering, to the point that, you know, it's not just, there's a lot of theft in the system, unfortunately. And so with smart metering, you are able to isolate where the theft is coming from. And they had a solution where, you know, within a, a ring of about five or six um, um, establishments, they were able to pinpoint exactly which one was stealing. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, right. and so they can tell you some very interesting ways of being able to achieve those losses. And also penalties right. for, you know, theft of electricity. It's mm -hmm. very severe in England, mm -hmm. and I think those kind of measures can be brought in very quickly. Well, I, I, I think given the mm -hmm. culture already we have in yeah. terms of how people access electricity in Nigeria, I think those sound like very interesting and useful points to note. We'll, let's take a quick break now. we we'll still come back to this conversation. Let's pause for another commercial break. More on Nigeria's power reforms right after this. Welcome back to our special focus on power sector reforms in Nigeria. And Wale, I want to bring you into the conversation now. As we begin to talk about investments and bringing more investments, especially when term kicks off. And before we get into all of that, maybe let's talk about bank exposures to the, the sector and what term will do for that. Um, there's been a lot of talk about banks being very exposed to the um, power sector. In fact, some have suggested that this may be another reason why AMCO may want to bail out the banks because they are concerned that it's not working. But your thoughts about how TEM will make things easier for the banks? Yeah, um, thanks again, Wally. The, the banks have significant exposure to the power sector, no doubt, because you remember that when the privatization happened, uh, the $2.4 billion that was invested into the sector was mostly provided uh, by Nigerian investors and most of the monies came from the banks. That said, I think the, the issues around uh, banks uh, having difficulties with repayments, et cetera, were a little bit overblown because there was nervousness around what was going to happen. The intervention fund has provided the clarity that everybody needed mm. to say, look, just hold on, you know, the, the sector, the issues are being resolved. And don't forget there was a moratorium period on many of these loans. Yeah. So those moratorium the moratorium period is just coming to an end for many of those transactions. Right. So you, I'm not aware of any cases where there's actually been a default yet, but people are just looking ahead to say we want to forestall you know, a, this incidence of default mm. by getting the economics of the sector to work. And the scaremongering is going to die down, mm. that's for sure. Yes. And more particularly, we're getting banks who are saying, look, for further investment, we're going to use the declaration of term and the provision of this fund as a condition precedent to providing further funding into the sector. Mm. So it's almost like you have a queue of transactions that are waiting to close, right. but nothing is happening until you know we get this. Uh, right. You know, so term, certainly good news for the banks. Certainly very good news. All right, yes. Nebuka, let's hear from you about um, how term impacts investments into this sector. And especially foreign investment. I know um, Embed has been very key to facilitating some major investments into, into the sector recently. Your take about how TEM changes the game, how it makes it a little more attractive for investors, especially international investors, to look at Nigeria. Uh, thank you. Uh, definitely, investors are keen uh, to see the declaration of TEM. A question that usually comes up in the course of negotiations is what if we conclude this um, uh, PPA? When will it become effective? We are still within this interim rule period. Mm -hmm. And uh, when contracts, contractual obligations are somewhat suspended. And so uh, for you to actually have um, line up your lenders to lend to uh, a multi-million dollar project, they need to be sure that the contracts you're signing mm -hmm. are legally binding. And so definitely uh, TEM will uh, also send a big signal to the investment community that um, they should proceed to make their investment decisions. 
The um, other thing I'll mention is that the as much as the NBT um, is set up to um, give confidence to investors, the true confidence in the market will actually come from having cost-reflective tariffs mm. that ensure that there are no funding gaps in the market. And so the to the quest to the other issue that had been discussed about the CBN intervention fund is a very welcome development. But what I think is more critical is ensuring that there is no need for a second intervention two, three years down the line. Mm. Because why, should, why could there possibly be another need? It would happen if the funding gap is not closed. Right. If Which the CBN fund by the tariffs, I imagine. Precisely. If the right. CBN fund simply takes care of um, past debts, but going forward, the debts continue to rack up, then we have a, a big problem on our hands. Yeah. And so it's important that on day one, when time is declared, that the first billing cycle that comes from that after post-term, that there is no funding gap in the market. Yeah. It means that the tariff must be right. It means that the, the discourse must be alive to your responsibilities in terms of collection of um, uh, revenues to the extent that the over the last year, NERC has worked with the uh, discos to audit their losses. And so we expect that whatever losses have been determined and with the f f money coming in, that it will be, and plus the cost reflective tariff, will be that the issue of um, f gap in the market, a uh, funding gap, will be a thing of the past. Right. And that going forward, discos will be fully viable. NBET sitting in the middle will not have on due exposure because of one disco or the other that is not alive to its res responsibilities. And of course, the NBT is um, also paying the, uh, the, uh, the Jenkos. And if that happens, then the ultimate goal is not just TEM, but also moving to the uh, TEM is not the last phase of development of the market. It's the medium term market. Mm -hmm. And right. at that time, NBT starts to wind down its functions because yeah. the role of intermediary will, will, should be diminishing because all the other entities in the sector are you know, g getting more and more um, effective in the work they do. Right, well the good news at least from what we've heard today from AO is that we would see those tariffs come to play just before term kicks off. But let me hear from you, um, Dioye, about the potential for investments closer to you. So we're talking things like the gas, the gas industry. Your thoughts about what term could do for that sector? It's, I think it's very much in line with what everybody else has said. It's, it creates comfort. I think once you have the right level of comfort uh, that the system can run and run the proper way, I think what you're going to see is, one, I strongly believe that we're going to see situations where there's going to be a lot more investment, uh, not only in the public sector, as you know, the NGC, MPDC domain, mm. but I think we're also going to see some very creative things start to happen. I think we're already starting to hear, you know, noise levels to some extent of some of those projects happening. Uh, for us, it's going to be about who can deliver gas to me right. the quickest. Right. the right volume I need and, uh, and be able to do it consistently. Uh, as you know, gas is a pass-through cost. Uh, I keep telling people that. I mean, yes, we want to manage our tariff, but if we get it close enough to where it should be, uh, yeah. I think what you're going to see is generation continues to go up. Right. And I think for me, that's, that's my number one job, is just to make sure that we have the right levels of generation right. and make sure that distribution companies are able to take it. Right. And that's good news, of course, for Nigeria as a whole. Absolutely. So your thoughts about the type of investment we can see coming this way? And I think it's very important to note, especially in this first round of investments in the power sector, we really haven't seen that massive injection of foreign investment, debt, equity, et cetera. So your thoughts about now that TEM seems to be right around the corner, we're about to see it happen. What can we expect in terms of investment into this space? I think that we would spend an hour discussing that and probably wouldn't even begin to touch it. Mm. Why? The power sector is basically an enabler for the entire economy. So I can sit down here and talk about generation, transmission, distribution, investment, but what about metering? What about industry? What about small scale, small and medium scale enterprises? What about um, cottage industry, what about education, what about health, what about agriculture, it's all there. Um, but it starts from, I think, w one thing I should say, jumping off what uh, um, Ade said about gas, it's not that the gas is not there, it's just that like in the electricity sector itself, the economics didn't make sense. So we've gradually spent, we've spent the last four years gradually ramping up to a cost reflective price for gas itself. Mm. And we now have that, a, 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 a tariff that 
is attractive, if nothing else, to bring people into the frame. And then going forward, that price will continue to be attractive. So you continue to see investment in the obvious cases, like you said, in gas processing, in gas transportation investment. Um, and I suspect that very quickly also, because the federal government is a dominant player in the two transmission sectors in the energy business, in power and in gas transmission, mm -hmm. you will see very quickly that there's room also for the private sector to come in there. And they will come in there because the economics do make sense. Right. But once we begin to do that, then of course, we will actually see in Nigeria something that we probably ne never thought we'd see, which is each year, year after year, generation capacity, transmission capacity, distribution capacity ramping up. Mm. And um, like I tell people, Nigeria will be just one massive construction site. But then again, it takes us into industry. It takes us into social, uh, the social sector. It takes us into um, um, governance itself, so to speak, because the moment people begin to are able to have the ability to fend for themselves because they've got more power, things yeah. change. And I really don't want to speculate. I can only say that if you look at other industries or sorry, other other countries that have experienced the kind of things that we, the growth can only be phenomenal. Right. Um, and hopefully we will all take advantage of that in one form or the other. Well, you, I mean, you're, you're a banker, so you are it's closer to the money. You see the interest from foreign investors, local investors. What will TEM do for investments into the power sector? Well, um, like you said, Wally, there are a lot of investors waiting on the sidelines to get into you know, the power sector. We talk to them all the time. Some of them are already getting in. We, brought an investor into Nigeria into the, for the last power sector privatization. But um, to really, you know, the next step, we haven't seen any of the global utilities come into this market yet. And if you look at how Latin America and other places are developed, first of all, you get the small players who come in and do 100, 200 megawatts there and there. But there are some guys who wouldn't touch anything below 1,000 megawatts. And those guys control significant amounts of funds. So the next level of evolution is for those big funds to come in, as well as the utilities, the actual operators themselves, mm -hmm. and start to acquire power plants in Nigeria. That's where we're going to see the consolidation. Right. We're certainly looking yeah. forward to that. Yeah, Absolutely. If, I, if I can just interject, we should never gloss over the fact that we wouldn't be able to bring in any of these so-called big boys if Nigerians themselves did not actually knuckle under and get the job done. At the end of the day, nobody's going to come into this market, however promising it is, until we ourselves, Nigerians, policymakers, regulators, operators, banks, have actually got our feet wet, got into that muck, you know, raked it through, and cleaned up the sector. And nobody mm. else will ever come and do it for us. And right. I don't think we should, we should really gloss, gloss over that. A lot of the investors who came in, the banks that came in with them, um, took, you know, went ahead with these investments because we're Nigerians. All right, we will, in quote, manage it. And I think we've done a damn good job of that. And we, we, we really, we, I mean, I'm not speaking out here, you know, because I, I, I want to give them praise, you know, in the banking sector, in the, in the operating sector. But no foreigner would have done what Nigerians have done. We just wouldn't, we, do, we just walk away from it. Mm -hmm. And we, sh we should never really gloss away from that. We've done a lot of work over the last year. We've looked at the sector. We've put in place the right policies. We've been very patient. I know some generating companies like Adiz and one or two others that actually invested in buying spare parts, 12, 18 months worth of spare parts, knowing that they wouldn't be paid, mm. all right? But confident that policymakers and regulators were doing the right things to ensure that eventually the sector came good. And it's mm. coming through now. And then two or three years down the line, all these big names will come in. We'll do the IPOs, you know, PE funds, infrastructure funds, big banks will come in. And it would be like nothing had ever happened before they, before they got in, but a lot of things had been done. Well, you make sector. it sound very exciting, and we certainly look forward to it happening. So as we begin to round up, and we're speaking about TEM, it's something that is going to happen from all indications. Everyone is very optimistic about that. And Dave, if you can just start, as we wrap up, your, your thoughts about TEM, you know, what, what we should really be focusing on as we get into that stage of Nigeria's power sector reforms. Um, focusing on as, as, as a generator or focusing on as a Nigerian? So well, focusing uh, on as an industry. I okay, think you okay, have okay. participated so in the So as a Nigerian in industry. industry, okay. So, no, I, I think, look, we, like we've all said it, we welcome it. We welcome it as a next step, as a next logical step, as a next rightful step. Uh, I think we're going to start seeing, like I said, performance, contracts, we get that. 
And then accountability is really the key. We're going to be accountable for what it is that we're doing in this sector. And that then takes us to the medium term. And every, every other thing that's going to happen after that, uh, it's next good thing. It needs to happen. Yeah. Uh, I think it's also important that because I'm being asked as, as, as a generator in industry, it's very important to say that there's no clear line of sight to what day it starts. I think we had a, we had a date of November 1st. Uh, circumstances have made us to move it. Uh, like we say on Nigerian flights, you know, it gets delayed and you don't know what it gets. No. <laughs> and then you get told about well, two hours after it gets delayed that sorry for the delay. So <laughs> we don't want that to happen now. I think if there's going to be a push where it's not going to happen November 1st, which is really one, two more working days from now, right. I think it's important that we let it out and we just right. let us know when right. it's going to happen. So clarity for planning, a big uh, point to take away from there. Nemeka, your thoughts as we look in at, the, in uh, at TEM and about, it's about to kick off, what are your thoughts at this point? A very welcome development. Um, getting into the phase of um, the uh, development of the electricity industry, where we have clearly defined um, responsibilities as well as uh, contractual remedies, it um, is, as, as has been said, is the next logical step. And um, we hope that that also sets the stage for uh, once we declare, once time is declared, the, the next goal should be to focus on the medium-term market. Mm. So as much as it's something that we will um, celebrate and uh, as um, a, a key milestone that has been attained in the power sector, it's important that we don't uh, celebrate for too long, mm. but we continue to focus on what lies ahead right. and pushing ahead all the uh, stakeholders in the sector, working together to move towards that um, position. And um, I may add here that the motto of uh, NBT is in Nigeria where electricity take, is taken for granted. Mm. And uh, in the same way we currently take um, mobile phone communication for granted, we hope that TEM, the ultimate benefit of TEM and what goes beyond TEM will be that electricity will ultimately be taken for granted in this country. All right, so not focus too much on TEM, but even looking further ahead. Very important point to make here. Wale, final thoughts? Yeah, mm. I'm looking forward to a time post term when we start to get the companies in the sector to a very healthy state that allows us to release the significant war chest of pension fund investment into the power sector because they, they are the uh, biggest repository of long-term money in this country right now. And we need to be able to release that into yeah. the power sector. And we'll do that through creating instruments such as bonds, listing the companies, in a way that allows these funds to be able to participate. Right, very important point. We need to get those funds. They are waiting there to be used. Final thoughts, Ayo, very quickly, if you can, please. OK, um, are they, I, I'm certain that, I mean, I wish I was the minister, then I would have said something. But I'm not the minister. It's his prerogative, and I'm not going to take that away from him at all. But I'm certainly clear in my mind that we will go into term before the year ends. Mm. That's one. Having said that, from speaking as a regulator now, um, the existence of a market with rules in it is always about discipline in the market. And it's even more critical in a, in a country like ours in Nigeria where you have 11 mo companies, discos, that are all monopolies. So corporate governance and discipline in the market is critical. But NERC is in a position where it, it believes in that. And the good thing about bringing in the private sector is that that kind of discipline also comes in. So we're not alone in trying to get companies to focus on reducing losses and serving their consumers um, the best way they can. And so um, I'm really um, optimistic about the fact that we're working towards the declaration. And post-declaration, Nigerians will begin to see a power sector that is actually an enabler mm. and not a disabler. Right. Absolutely. And thank you. Very well said. A very distinguished panel giving us very insightful ideas about the transitional electricity market coming to Nigeria. The regulator has said it should happen before the end of the year. And that ends the end of our conversation. That marks the end of our conversation about the impact of the delayed declaration of the transitional electricity market. Many thanks to AIPO, the Commissioner Thank Market you. Competition Thank and you. Rates at the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, Wale Shunibare, Managing Director of Investment Banking at UBA Capital, and Emeka Welukwa, he is the Company Secretary and at the Nigeria Bulk Electricity Trading Company, and of course, Adele Fadebi, the CEO of Transco Ugeli Power. Gentlemen, thank you very much, and thank you for joining. Until our next program is goodbye from me, Wale Famewa. Thank you very much for watching.